and this is so relevant now to this day still, because uh, we're talking about the, the lead up to the election. Uh, largely this book spans through, I don't know, Greg, it's like you published it a minute ago. It goes all the way through the Helsinki summit. Um, so I want to talk about the presidency, but this political threat is very important because as the Republicans rejected the appeals, not by the White House, the Obama White House, but by the intelligence community and intelligence leaders to make a statement to do something to fight back against the Russians, they just, they shut it down. And you write, Greg, that Putin had weaponized intelligence, McConnell and the GOP had weaponized denial. Yeah, there's a scene in the book um, that is new um, that describes a confrontation between the CIA director, John Brennan, and the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, in the, in the fall of 2016, as the election is approaching. Um, Brennan had spent, uh, the CIA had gotten some amazing intelligence, breakthrough intelligence, we lay it out in the book uh, in the late July timeframe. Brennan spent two days sequestered in his office he was so alarmed by this, he closes, every, he closes the door, doesn't let anybody in, and he spends two days in his office just pouring over all of the intel on Russia that the agency has. He comes out of it just sort of stricken, uh, calls the White House, I need to see the president right away. Goes to the White House, tells Obama what's happening. The first thing they do is try to set up a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with the congressional leaders for Brennan so that he can tell them the same thing he's told the president. That's pretty unusual. Uh, the CIA director usually meets with groups of lawmakers, doesn't do these one-on-one -on -one briefings, so it's really indicative of the level of alarm. He's just astonished that when he gets to McConnell and they have their meeting, and he starts to lay out all of this intelligence that shows that Putin has actually approved this operation himself, uh, and is leading toward the idea of we need to call this out, we need to do something about this, McConnell argues that, no, it sounds like you're trying to meddle in the election, and not Russia. Uh, he says uh, that he is not prepared to call out Putin, but would be prepared to call out Obama and Brennan and the Obama administration for meddling in the election if they tried to do anything like this. Um, it's just a, one of many moments in this book, and it's part of a broader theme that speaks to, as you were saying, the sort of political forces we're dealing with in this country at this moment. I don't, it wasn't always like this, right? It's there just time after time where partisan impulses just overwhelm everything. Overwhelm concern for the country. In this case, overwhelm concern for one of the most precious mechanisms of American democracy, a presidential election. What is more sacred than that? And there was an utter inability to get any agreement to have any bipartisan condemnation of what Russia was doing. Ellen, you're nodding your head. Yeah, um, I think, Greg, you put your, your f uh, finger on it, on it right there, um, because what Russia, in fact, exploited was this particular moment in, in time in our country where we are so deeply divided and polarized along political lines and sometimes in religious lines, social economic lines, our ground was fertile. We were susceptible to uh, Russian interference because of, the, of those divisions. Russia was able to exploit them. They didn't create the divisions. The, the, the scene you just vividly laid out, it just encapsulates that. And, and as Craig, Craig could probably explain too, it's not just the Russians that exploited all of this. We have internal domestic actors that, that put out divisive messages from the left, from the right, and Russia amplified those messages. And sometimes it, 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 it amplified them and impersonated those messages better than the groups themselves. Um, there was like, I think, one Black Lives Matter, blacktivists group that sort of took on the Black Lives Matters themes and put up a fake page on Facebook that got way more likes and shares than the actual Black Lives Matters page. But this was all happening in the same moment in 2016. We had internal political turmoil, and Russia just swooped in and, and brilliantly exploited that. And if I can um, expand on that just for a second, you know, people wonder, well, you know, hasn't propaganda always been out there? Hasn't uh, active measures, you know, been part of our relationship with Russia and the Soviets for, you know, a century? But there is something very particular that happened in 2016 that actually couldn't have happened much sooner, and that is the Russians were able to identify particular groups and send them 
individualized messages. So it isn't like I was getting messages, you know, that were, that were aimed at, you know, a young African American man in Oakland, right? But he was getting those messages, right? I was getting messages aimed at, you know, boring middle aged white people in Washington. And so, like, the, the ability to, the, the social media companies, um, have atomized all of us. They've identified us. They've 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 put us into a thousand different buckets, and they've given the ability to aim a particular message at those individual buckets, and really at all of us individually to advertisers. Well, guess who advertised? The Russians advertised. They 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 and they paid in rubles. <laughs> and uh, so the the ability. So we we meaning the country built this unbelievable, completely unprecedented system to in a in an atomized way target individual voters. That has never, ever happened before, and the Russians did it. And so that's one reason why it was, everybody was so slow to perceive what was going on on the social media front, because everyone was getting different messages. And it was slipping in between our news feed messages about, like, you know, Aunt Mary's, you know, tuna casserole, or, you know, my brother's new kid, or whatever. All that stuff just flowed into these feeds, and they managed to, they managed to deliver in a way that absolutely confirmed people's pre-existing ideas about what was going on. And that meant if you were a huge Bernie Sanders supporter, you were getting messages that said Bernie Sanders was great and Hillary Clinton was a crook. If you were a huge Donald Trump supporter, D Donald Trump is great, Hillary Clinton's a crook. So there was a consistent message about Clinton, but in every other way, it was targeted in a really, really particular way. And if you were a Clinton supporter, you probably were getting a message that you sh shouldn't bother to vote, particularly if you were African American. People have not really keyed in on how much the suppression efforts were serious and rich, and it's not like that's never happened before, but to have another country target a core Democratic Party group and tell them not to vote in a, in a way that was completely secretive and, 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 and sneaky, it's just never happened before.